Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about the raft consensus algorithm. This is uh, what etcd runs. And uh, it was my PhD work at Stanford University, along with my advisor, John Osterhout. Um, so what, what are we trying to accomplish? We, we just want a small amount of state. Uh, we want it accessible from anywhere. And we just want to be able to read and write to it. So what would happen if we put that state on a single host? Well, that'd be easy. We'd probably, you know, instead of spending two or three years on it, it'd take an afternoon, maybe. Less than go, I guess. Um, and it'd be consistent. If you issue a write on that, the moment you issue a read following it, you'll get that latest data. So it's really easy for clients to work with. But uh, if that host goes down, we just lost all our state. So it's prone to failure. And so with Raft, we want to keep the consistent part, uh, but we want to make it fault tolerant. And as much as possible, we want to make it easy. OK, so consensus is really, how do we reach agreement on shared state? Or people sometimes call this single system image. So we want to look at this cluster with shared state as if, uh, as if it was just one beefy machine that can never fail. And so it should recover from internal server failures autonomously. Um, and this, if, if a minority of servers fail, that shouldn't be an issue. So in this little diagram, we got five servers. If two of those servers fail, just a minority, um, the whole cluster should remain available and always maintain consistency. If a third one were to fail, then we'd lose our majority. We'd lose availability. Um, so, the, so the cluster would go offline. You wouldn't get access to that shared state. But it would remain consistent. At least it wouldn't be corrupt. And the moment a third server comes back up, you'd be able to get access to it again. So consensus is the key to building any consistent storage system. Uh, if you look at a distributed storage system, something that provides fault tolerance, at some level in there, it's got to have consensus. Um, if not, it's just broken, or there's some single point of failure somewhere. OK, so consensus is important. How, how it's normally used is what's called uh, the replicated state machine architecture. This, this diagram has a lot going on, but I'll try to explain it. So, here I've got a three-server cluster and a bunch of clients on top issuing requests. So each server in the cluster run, has three things. It's got a consensus module, a copy of the replicated log, and a state machine. The state machine's the thing that clients are trying to interact with. So in etcd's case, it's this key value store that's hierarchical. Um, here I've just drawn a simple map from you know, x has the value 1, y2, et cetera. And so, uh, so let's see. If our goal is to get the state machine uh, to look the same on every server, then the key idea of the replicated state machine approach is let's just have every state machine uh, pull commands off of a replicated log. And if all of these logs have the same sequence of commands, commands such as set x to 3, set y to 2, if all of these logs look the same on all the different servers, and they're running the same deterministic state machine code, then they'll all end up in the same state. And so clients can kind of jump around from one to another, and it'll all behave as if they're talking to one coherent system. OK. so. Well, how do we keep that log consistent across the servers? That is what a consensus algorithm does. So uh, in this talk, I'm not going to talk much about the state machines. That's kind of an application level question. The important thing is that they, uh, they replay commands from the replicated log, and they arrive at the same stakes. The consensus module is really the hard part here. How do we get those logs to look the same on the different servers? Um, as I said before, the system makes progress, should make progress as long as any majority of the servers are up. And the failure model that 
uh, Raft and Paxos consider is fail stop. So uh, servers can crash and they can restart later. Uh, messages can be dropped, delayed, lost. Um, and all of that will be handled, uh, you know, up, up to a point, it'll be handled maintaining availability. Uh, if, if too many servers crash, you'll lose the availability for a while. Uh, and, and we're not really considering arbitrary or Byzantine faults here. Okay, so a couple years ago, I wanted to build a replicated state machine, and the state of the art there uh, for the consensus algorithm was Paxos. This is a protocol uh, developed by Leslie Lamport in the late 80s. And when I started this work, it was nearly synonymous with consensus. But it's got a couple problems, as we discovered. Um, so NSDI is a top, it's actually going on right now in Oakland, top conference in uh, networking and academia. We submitted a paper talking about Raft, and an anonymous reviewer replied back, the dirty little secret of the NSDI community is that at most five people really truly understand every part of Paxos. And so this is, consensus is fundamental to distributed systems. Here we have one of the top distributed systems conferences, and there's five people around that understand Paxos. That's a problem. <laughs> That's a serious problem, right? That means we basically can't teach this in schools because we have more than five schools. <laughs> um, by the way, how many people here would say they uh, are competent in Paxos? Got one-ish hand. Uh, how many people here are competent in Raft? Just a few more, awesome. Um, <laughs> So, you people that raised your hands, uh, feel free to go across the street. There's a good bar called Mickler. Um, <laughs> for the rest of you, I'll try to teach Raft in the next few minutes. Uh, I'm not gonna bother with Paxos, just skip it. <laughs> okay, so Paxos is hard to understand. The other problem is, it is not really complete if you're trying to build a real world system. Um, Chubby is a replicated state machine that's uh, proprietary inside of Google, and they, they wrote this nice rant called Paxos Made Live, uh, including there are significant gaps between the description of the Paxos algorithm and the needs of a real-world system. The final system will be based on an unproven protocol. So there's so much you have to develop beyond the Paxos literature, and then what you end up with is a system where the Paxos proofs aren't gonna help your correctness, and you're basically, uh, you're on your own. So with Raft, uh, we tried to address these problems. We wanted, you know, Paxos is correct and complete and performs well, at least if you build it right. And we wanted all these things, but we also really wanted Raft to be understandable. Something that, you know, we could teach in schools or Someone can pick up a paper and learn in the matter in, in a few hours. And so, at every step of the way, when we had a design choice to make, we asked what, what would be easier to understand or explain. Um, and that led to something, Raft has a fundamentally different decomposition than Paxos. You'll see what that decomposition is on the next slide. Uh, it, it restricts the ways servers can differ from each other so that the state space that it operates in is less complex. And overall, it has very little mechanism to uh, arrive at the same end result of a replicated state machine. So now I'll try to teach you Raft. Uh, Raft is broken up into three parts. We've got leader election, which happens whenever a leader fails. Uh, log replication is really uh, where you spend most of your time. And then safety, um, it's really just a couple of if statements, but conceptually we need to tie these things together. So in leader election, uh, we're going to select one of the servers to act as the cluster leader. And if that leader fails, we're gonna detect crashes and select a new leader. 
In log replication, that leader is going to take commands from clients. So remember back to that replicated state machine diagram. It'll take, only the leader is going to take commands from the clients. It's going to append them to its own log, and then it's going to try to replicate its log to the other servers. If the other servers have something else, it'll just get overwritten. So in safety, we tie those things together. So if we're to elect just any server to become leader and it overwrites inconsistencies blindly, that'd be bad. And so with safety, we tweak things a little bit so that only a server with an up-to-date log can become leader. And so it's eligible. Okay. Oh my god. All right, so I use this uh, visualization called RAF scope to explain how these things work. Um, this is sort of a full-blown Raft implementation written in JavaScript that runs in the browser, and I've pre-recorded uh, these things so that I can show you all the edge cases. So first, we've got leader election. Um, I'm going to go through a leader election pretty quickly and then uh, more slowly. I'll explain it. Watch server two over there. So it just became leader and sent out a round of heartbeats, and now that's paused. Uh, cool. OK. Um, so let me explain a little bit. We've got a five server cluster. And here, server two is our leader. You can tell because it's bold and it's got the orange font. Um, the other servers are in a state that's called follower. So when they know of a current leader, they'll just be in the follower state. Um, these uh, servers expect to hear heartbeats from the leader periodically. If they don't, they're going to time out. These are the timeouts on the uh, circumference of the circle. And when they time out is when they start an election. Um, can you tell that it's paused? Well, all right. The little bottom left tells you it's paused. Um, that's why you're not seeing any heartbeats right now. So uh, what will happen next is I'm going to kill off server two, and we'll watch the next election. You note that uh, every server has this number inside. That's its term number. And so server two is the leader of term two right now. And you can have at most one leader per term. So when server two dies, uh, we'll try to elect a new leader for term three. So I'll play it from here. So I killed server two. And now it looks like server three is going to time out next. Server 3 timed out since it didn't get any heartbeats in server 2. And a few things happened here. Uh, so first off, it moved on to term 3. Right? There was a, it knew about term 2. There, there was a leader back then. There's no sense in trying an, another election for term 2. So it's trying to become leader in term 3. It incremented its own term. Um, the other servers are still back in term 2 because they haven't timed out yet. They haven't really noticed that server two died. And so every message in Raft includes the sender's term number. And if you receive a term three entry while, you, sorry, a term three message while you're in term two, you'll go ahead and update to term three. And not only that, if you got a term two message after that, you would just reject it, okay? So as soon as I play and these messages reach the other servers, you'll see them all move on to term three as well. Now, uh, server three already voted for itself. And to become a leader in Raft, so it's in, it's in what's called a candidate state right now. So it timed out and became a candidate. To become a leader, it needs to collect votes from a majority of the cluster, so in this case, of the full cluster. So in this case, it needs a total of three votes. And servers vote for themselves right when they become a candidate. So 
these little uh, circles you see within each, within the candidate represents how many votes it's gotten. Here, Server 3's gotten its own vote, and it hasn't gotten any of the others. It sent out these messages, these called request vote RPCs, uh, to try to get votes from the other servers. Okay, so the servers updated to term three, and they all granted their votes. For now, uh, votes are just granted on a first come, first serve basis, and we'll re revisit that later. And so, server three doesn't know it yet. These votes are grayed out in there. Uh, but soon it will get a majority of votes in the cluster. Soon it will have three votes, and it'll become leader. There we go. First job as leader is to send out heartbeats so that no one else starts a new election. Okay. So that was a normal case election where we waited for the server to time out. It sent, it out, sent out a round of RPCs, of request vote RPCs, got back uh, responses from half the cluster, becomes leader, and sends out a heartbeat. Now let's get into the not so good cases. Um, so what we needed for that election to work well was we needed one server to time out first. Uh, that way it could go and collect votes before those votes were already granted to other candidates. And let me show you what happens if that doesn't occur. So watch uh, server one and server five. They're about to time out at the exact same time. That's why I have to pre-record this, by the way, because yeah, you can't really make that happen otherwise. Um, so they both timed out. They're both tr candidates now. They're trying to become leaders in term four. And they both vote for themselves, and they both send out request votes to everyone else. And let's say it just so happens that uh, server four on the left votes for server five, and server three votes for server one. So each of these candidates is only getting two votes. And they can't get server two's vote. Um, that won't work. Server two's dead. So we're kind of stuck here. Um, and this is what we call a split vote, where no one can really get a majority because the votes are all tied up and server two is dead right now. And so uh, we could do something complicated here. We could have servers one and five communicate and try to say, well, I'll give up this vote. I'll give it to you if that helps you become leader, blah, blah, blah. Um, but that's hard, and that won't always work. And so in Raft, we just do the stupidest thing, which is that servers always have a timer going. Even these candidates have a timer going right now. And let's just let's forget about term four. Let's call that one wasted and move on to term five. And so if I keep, keep going here, uh, you'll watch, well, server three times out first in term five. It becomes leader for term five, and we're done. So we just wait an extra timeout in case of a split vote. Why is that OK? Well, split votes are rare. And they're designed to be rare. Um, and that's because these elections, these timeouts, they're all randomized. Um, so in this animation, uh, they all reset to somewhere between halfway and all the way around the circle. And if you have enough random spread there, say uh, five times your round trip time, your network round trip time, then it's highly likely that you won't get a split vote. And if you do, it's highly likely that it'll, it'll be resolved within the next timeout. OK? So that's leader election. Log replication. Now, once we have a leader, um, it's all about replicating its log outwards. And so uh, here's a five server cluster where server one is our leader, and three, four, and five uh, 
have crashed just to get them out of the way. And I'm now showing the logs on the right side of the screen. So uh, you have each server's log, the log entry for numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Um, it's a couple, a dot and an arrow that I'll explain in a moment. And here I'm showing uh, three log entries created on the leader. So pretend like one client came up to this leader three times with three requests, or maybe three different clients came up with one request each. Uh, so, so these entries would contain those state machine commands like set the value x to three. I'm not showing that. Uh, instead, what I'm showing is the leader's term number. So when the leader requests, a, a, when the leader receives a client request, it'll create a new entry in its log with its current term number. Okay, so server one's got three entries and its goal is to get those entries out to the rest of the cluster. I'll advance a little bit. Great, so we just watched server one uh, replicate that first entry over. Excuse me. So now I'll explain the dot and the arrow. Um, the arrow is called next index, and this is these are these are all local variables on the leader. Um, so for each other for each follower, where does the leader plan to send the next entry, or or where's the position in the log where it'll send the next entry? So for server two now that's uh, position two in the log. Um, the dot is the match index, and that's that's what's really used for determining when entries are, are safe and durable and committed, as we call it. So the dot means uh, the leader knows that it and the follower agree up to that point. So here, server one knows that it and server two agree all the way up through just the first index. And if I let this play forward, uh, these two will advance all the way to the end of the log. Okay, so once the next index goes past the end of the log, by the way, um, these RPCs just turn into heartbeats where they, they don't carry any log entries. Uh, the RPC that's used during log replication, by the way, is called append entries, like please append this entry or uh, or you can even do batching, please append several entries to the end of your log. Okay, so we've got server two caught up with the leader. Um, you'll note that all of the entries so far have these dashed lines, meaning they're not committed, they have not been acknowledged to clients, they're not yet safe. Uh, why is that? Well. I told you that our goal is that um, if any majority of the cluster is up, then it needs to be, Raft should be available and provide a full level of consistent service. So what if we kill server one and server two right now and bring up three, four, and five? They don't have any copies of these log entries, but the cluster would have to be available. And so that, that implies, well, these entries just can't be marked committed yet. We need to replicate them out to at least a majority of the cluster before we can acknowledge them to clients, before we can apply uh, the effects to, or the commands to the state machines. So let's do that. Let me uh, bring up server three. Great, so now we've uh, replicated the first entry over to server three and that was acknowledged, so server one was able to uh, bump its match index for server three. And now you'll note that server one marked that entry committed on it, in its local log. So uh, the solid line means committed. And the, the rule for that in Raft is that a leader that creates an entry can mark that entry committed once it's reached a majority of the cluster. Okay? So at this point, server one has it committed, um, 
and the other fervor still don't know that it's committed. So the followers are, uh, their state machines are a little bit behind because they don't get to apply the command yet. Um, so that's fine. Piggybacked on the next append entries request, uh, the server will send, the, send its current commit index over to the followers, and so they'll be able to update. You can just kind of watch that working. And here we waited on the normal heartbeat timeout for that last one. OK, so now this cluster is in, uh, is in great shape. It's done, you know, even though a minority of the servers uh, have been down the whole time, uh, all of these entries are marked committed. They've all been applied to the state machines. The clients have gotten their answers. And no matter what happens um, in the future, as long as we've got three servers up and they retain their disk images, uh, these, uh, you know, this state will be safe. Okay. So to recap kind of normal log replication, what it takes is a client has to go up to server one and make a request. Sorry, go up to the leader and make a request. That leader has to do uh, a round of append entries RPCs to the cluster. Half of those have to come back before the leader marks it committed and then the leader can advance its state machine and reply to clients. And in the background, the leader will let the others know about the new commit index, and so they can advance their state machines shortly. All right. Similarly to the first section, uh, things may not work out quite so well. And that's because uh, Leaders can change, and so a new leader has to kind of clean up when the old leader left things, uh, you know, not in a perfect state. So there's two types of inconsistencies that can come up. The first one I'll talk about is missing entries, and the second one, extraneous entries. Um, this is our same cluster here, except I fast-forwarded quite a bit. So I brought up servers three and four, uh, killed off server one, and server two was elected leader just now. Oh, and before I did any of that, a uh, client went up to server one and submitted a couple of requests, uh, but server one crashed before it could get those out. That's just setting myself up for later. Okay, so servers, uh, server four here is the server that's missing entries. It was, it was down for the whole previous term, and so uh, it doesn't have any of these committed entries. And our goal, of course, the new leader is going to try to catch server four up. And so the new leader uh, is very conservative with where it sets the match index. Since that's used for commitment, which affects safety, and if that was wrong, everything would be broken. Uh, so it just initializes all those to zero, and it'll figure those out as we go. The next index, um, it's a little more optimistic. It just it assumes that you know everyone's got three entries in their in their logs, and we'll back that one up if we need to. So, server two. Um, when server two talks to server three, that's going to work well. They share the same log. So sending a heartbeat, it'll get an acknowledgment to that, and then it'll know to advance the match index, um, wow, uh, all the way up to cover the three entries. With server four, it's not quite so easy because um, server four is missing the entries. So we can watch that happen. So server three applies positively. Server four says, uh, actually, I, I, don't, I don't even know what you mean by, by index four. I'm totally not there yet. Um, really what's going on is append entries includes a built-in consistency check. And that is, if I'm going to send you, or in this case, heartbeat you index four, uh, it comes with a predicate that is, do you, at position three, have an entry with term two? 
for fervor three checks, do I have an entry with term two? Yep, fervor four, no, I don't have an entry there. So fervor four replies negatively. So you watch fervor four back up all the way. Yes, we agree on the empty log, and then they can build up from there. Okay, so that's how we repair missing entries. Um, just back up that next index until, until we match. Now, uh, fast forward a little bit. So, pretend like I um, created, uh, ma made a request to server three and uh, got that request committed. And so it's on servers two, three, and four. And, and so now we're looking at extraneous entries. So server one has those two uncommitted entries at the end of its log that we need to just get rid of um, because that pink entry we've promised to keep around forever. And those, those last two, oop, two blue entries uh, we don't actually want. Okay? So there's... You'll see server two just blindly overwrites server one's entries there. And there's two reasons why that's okay. Well, there's a whole bunch of reasons. Um, so first off, server one, its, it's term right now is term two. Uh, if it hears from a term three leader, it just assumes, hey, that leader's got more up-to-date information, so I'd better listen to it. And paired with that, we've got um, the consistency check. So server two is going to send off over that pink entry, but it's going to come with a predicate that says, hey, at position three, do you have a term two entry? So they'll agree on that. And given that, um, server one's just going to delete the, the conflicting entries off the end of its log and take that new pink one. So heartbeat to figure out what's going on. Another round to replace those entries. Okay, so that's how we deal with extraneous entries. Now, uh, third section on safety. Well, so far, this is completely broken and uh, won't actually keep your data. <laughs> what could go wrong? Well, Server 5's been offline for for a long time now. Um, suppose I turn it on again and uh, I'll kill off our old leader. Well, what, what would happen if server five right now timed out first before anyone else? And so it would try to become leader and yet it's got no log entries. Um, that would pretty much be catastrophic, right? If it became leader and then some other client went up to it and it just started overwriting every entry in the cluster, um, that'd be an issue. And so when this server requests votes from everyone else, it's actually not getting any votes granted. Um, why? Well, it's including information about its log when it, when it requests the vote. It includes the length of its log, zero, and the term of its lo last log entry, um, also a zero for empty log. And so these servers check, check their own logs. They say, no, our, our log, our, my log is better than your log, so I'm not giving you my vote. And, there, and that way, um, server five can get no more, it cannot possibly get a majority of the votes in the cluster right now. And then um, servers, You'll notice these servers didn't reset their, their timeouts because they didn't grant their vote. They don't believe that any progress is being made towards the leader. And so we'll actually have server three timeout uh, very shortly here. And since its log is completely up to date and eligible, it actually became leader. Okay, so let me go over the voting rule uh, one more time in more detail. Um, so if here we have three logs, this uh, middle server would never vote for the bottom server because the middle server has a log that's strictly longer. 
And similarly, the top server would never vote for the middle server because its last log term, that is the term of its last log entry, takes precedence here. If I have a four as my last log term, I assume my information's better than someone that's got a three there. And if you uh, take this check on, on vo this voting rule in aggregate, that means if I can get a majority of votes, then my log is more up to date than a majority of the clusters. And so actually, those servers already have every entry that could possibly have been marked committed in their logs. They may not know those entries are marked committed yet, but if they just preserve them and replicate them outwards, that's completely safe. And you can see the raft paper for an argument and a pointer to the proof. Okay, so to recap, um, we had three different uh, sub-problems. Leader election, where we used heartbeats and timeouts to detect crashes. We made those timeouts randomized so that split votes would be rare and they would be resolved quickly if we do run into them. Um, and the majority voting guarantees that we can have at most one leader per term. Then during log replication, the leader takes commands from clients and appends them to its own log, and it replicates that log outwards to the other followers, just overriding any inconsistencies it finds. Um, the append entries RPC includes this consistency check that simplifies the way logs can differ. So they always, you can't have a mishmash of logs. They always agree on a prefix, and then uh, you know one may be older than the other. In safety, um, I showed you how we only elect leaders with all committed entries in their logs, and so that avoids having to transfer entries to the new leader or anything like that. Uh, one thing I didn't quite touch on is that if a new leader uh, inherits entries from a prior term and those entries are not marked committed yet, uh, it'll actually wait until it can replicate out, say, a no-op from its own term before marking those old entries committed. And that's needed for safety. You can see the paper for the details. Uh, to conclude, when we started this work, uh, consensus was widely regarded as difficult, and so we designed Raft for understandability. Uh, we think it's easier to teach in classrooms, and actually universities have started to pick it up and teach it. Um, there's a, a course at Brown right now where uh, about 30 students have to each implement Raft, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> um, sorry to them. Uh, we think it's a better foundation for building practical systems than Paxos uh, because it is understandable and also because there, there's a lot that goes into a complete implementation um, that we've kind of spelled out for people. And so a lot of that you can find in my dissertation, uh, 250 pages on this stuff. So you need things like um, if you want to change the membership in your Raft cluster, well, that changes the meaning of majority, doesn't it? And so you need to go through the consensus algorithm to do that. So that's cluster membership changes. Uh, log compaction is um, your Raft, the way I've described it, your Raft log is just going to keep growing and growing and growing. And eventually, you'll run out of space, or you won't be able to reboot. And so uh, log compaction is, you know, do you take snapshots or some other approach to, to deal with that? Uh, Client interactions often overlooked. This is how do clients uh, find the leader? How, how do they um, submit their commands in a way that they can, uh, they can retry their commands and not have them applied multiple times? Uh, so that one's really important, uh, often a source of bugs, and, and I think pretty interesting. Um, and I've also done a whole bunch of evaluation I don't have time to share here. Uh, both on understandability and correctness and, and performance. Um, thanks. I'll take questions, and if you don't have time here, uh, try the mailing list. <laughs>